Okay, <clears throat> so uh, here I want to talk a bit more about the nature of the sacred, that is, you know, um, the spiritual dimension, that which is sort of the source of religion in terms of human experience. Uh, as I've mentioned in previous videos, the essence of religious experiences and engages two basic things, an experience of there being uh, forces, powers, energies of a non-material nature. Mind you, today we could think of it as material in terms of physics and whatnot, but you know, for, for ancient times, it was a non-physical type of power or energy, number one, which we call mana. And then the other was will or consciousness, uh, the sense of animism, that everything seems to be alive, of consciousness. There's an encounter with um, consciousness or intelligence of another dimension within plants, animals, even beyond that, spirit entities, gods, that there exists consciousness outside of just the humans. Okay, And those are the two key things that we find uh, really quite universal in terms of aspects of the human experience of the sacred or the religious dimension. And so just to highlight a little bit more about these here, I'm going to first talk about mana, whoops, sorry, the sacred as energy power. Hang on here. There was a good quote that I've got here. Oh, let me just remove this so you can read this. Um, there's a quote by Manly P. Hall in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, which is really quite a, a good little summary here. Realizing that visible bodies are only symbols of invisible forces, the ancients worshipped the divine power through the lower kingdoms of nature, okay? Realizing that, again, nature is basically an embodiment of something fundamentally spiritual. Many would call that nature is sort of um, the body and the soul of the world is the divine manifest in nature, sort of the idea, okay? The sages of old studied living things to a point of realization that God, so to speak, is most perfectly understood through a knowledge of his supreme handiwork animate and inanimate nature. But back then they didn't think of nature as being inanimate, okay? That's what we say today. Every existing creature manifests some aspect of the intelligence or power of the eternal one. And that's the key thing here. Everything, existing creature, but also aspect of the universe, be it plant, animal, or even stone <laughs> uh, manifest some aspect of the intelligence or consciousness or power force energy of the eternal one that is the source of all so that's just something to keep in mind okay all right whoops hang on here so first off in terms of nature right, is believed that various stones metals you know the elements of the earth Okay, that there are different kinds of forces, energies, power in the different aspects of, you know, what we think of just earth elements, right? Uh, so that, you know, there'd be certain stones that are regarded as sacred, as holy, as having special powers. This is what today people talk about crystals, right? Crystals having healing energies. Uh, it really has its roots going way back. So just an example, the Romans would place stones, special stones, as a way of protecting, all right, a certain place that would create a boundary and then also had a special power of protection. Okay. The gold itself has always been seen as being very, very important as having a special kind of field, a force field of energy that's associated with life and the power of the sun, right? And that's why the Egyptians used so much gold on their mummies. You know, when you see, um, you know, uh, the, the pharaoh images and whatnot, always covered in gold, uh, it's held that they're brought back to life. That it's a, can, it, it brings life to them in the afterlife. And so tied in with that in terms of mountains and whatnot, you know, you go, you know, expanding that from specific stones to larger mountains uh, that, Throughout the world, everywhere in ancient cultures, mountains are seen as sacred, that certain mounts and mountains are believed to have a special presence, energy around them, and a sense of divine presence, so that certain mountains are holy mountains. They become the place where the gods live, like Olympus for you know, the ancient Greco-Roman world, that's where all the gods lived, Mount Sinai in the Jewish tradition, right? Uh, Taoist immortals, they had these magical mountains where the immortals lived, you know, various things like this you find throughout the world. 
Um, trees as well are associated with uh, having certain kinds of special powers. And there be certain trees that are especially powerful, like the oak tree in, in Europe, uh, paganism. Um, they're often associated with aspects of fertility. Uh, Af certain African tribes will uh, have the, um, um, the placenta when a child is born, the placenta would be buried by that tree and it will always be connected then with you as a person from birth onward. Uh, there'd be a special connection between you and that tree. Uh, mythologies have a world tree or a tree of life is you find that everywhere all over the world, okay, in terms of ancient shamanism and uh, the, the whole biblical tradition about the, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in, in Genesis. Uh, you know, you have all kinds of stories around important trees. <laughs> the maypole is a, a symbol of fertility, like in European pagan traditions of uh, dancing around the maypole on May 1st. It's sort of like a spring fertility ritual. It's uh, is represent uh, the phallus symbol. So you have these various elements. Okay, so they'll show up all over the world, various teachings, mythologies, legends, and whatnot, as well as practices and traditions, that there's a special energy, a power around, you know, trees in various ways. And then, of course, water is a very important element that is held to have special powers, all right? Uh, it, obviously, it brings life to people, but it's often used for healings, especially for any kind of cleansing ritual, to cleanse yourself of sin, to be purified, undergoing baptism. It removes evil. Uh, it's, it's very, very powerful. And of course, it brings life to you, to the earth, and therefore has healing uh, properties. And then a sense of blessing, bringing prosperity. So you'll see water used in rituals all over the world, having the sense that it's got special power. Fire is used all over the world in, in religious rituals. Uh, again, that there is a power with fire for various purposes, okay? Uh, very commonly used in temples, like in Zoroastrianism. Agni is a god of fire over in India in terms of the Vedic tradition, right? Uh, you'll have uh, always a fire also in the Jewish temple. Um, candles, particular candles or whatnot being used incense used all over even you know whatever temples you go to today there'll be the use of incense and candles as believe that they bring into the heavenly realm your prayers uh they connect you with the spirit world with the heavenly realm <clears throat> okay as the candle is burning or the incense is burning the pagan tradition of the yule log at christmas time or with the winter solstice right uh that it is to keep the flames the fire of the sun alive and going to get us through the darkest time of the year so that the the light gets reborn for the coming year bringing us you know the summer um an old just again just to give you some highlight of things right so in roman times it was believed that there was a special couch that would be there by the hearth in in the home where the fire would be where you'd be making your food in, you know in the kitchen area and that the woman should lie there and as she lied there that would be a place of fertility for her to have children and so the fire is seen as bringing prosperity and children into the home as, as, and therefore it's the life of the home and uh and of course fire protects from evil you have various elements here across various traditions and cultures <clears throat> And tied in with all this is also the sense of certain people, places, and objects have such a power around them, such an energy around them, it becomes a taboo. It's like they're dangerous. It's dangerous to touch this object because it's so powerful, right? So that's where we get the idea of taboo from. It's potentially dangerous. And is very often associated with the very holy, holy objects, and that uh, you need to approach them with, you know, a lot of caution because they're dangerous. A classic example is the Ark of, of the Covenant in the Jewish tradition, and the whole film, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> is based on that theme. And it is there in the biblical tradition, the story is that you dare not touch the Ark. Anybody who would touch it would drop dead, and you've got stories of that in the Bible, of that happening. And uh, is that because it's held to be such a, a potent object full of spiritual power that the very presence of God is there and woe to you if you touch it.
Right? So that's the idea of taboo is it's like high voltage. Uh, it is so powerful, it then is to be respected and it's consecrated and it's forbidden to touch it. Tied in with that is in various societies, you'll have various traditions and, and whatnot, that strangers, a foreigner is potentially a being of real power and potential danger. So you're very cautious in how you approach them. Kings were seen as people of power as well. Of course, holy people, saints. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but uh, that you were to be very cautious in approaching them with the highest of respect. And if they touched you or you touched them, you know, it could be good or it could be bad. You could drop dead or you could be healed. You know, a lot of stories and traditions around that of being healed, right? And then, of course, women in menstruation, it's held that this was such a, a, a potent energy. Uh, associated with a woman being able to give birth to have children this is the source of her power to have children because you know in menopause you don't menstruate so that means you've lost that power so it's something potentially dangerous and therefore forbidden you you keep a distance from so there'll be all kinds of rituals and, and whatnot around that and then, you know, just so, you know, people, you know, in French and in German, in German, you say, Gruß Gott, you know, and in French, adieu. And it is like saying greetings to that person as though they're embo an embodiment of the divine. Gott is God, Dieu is uh, we're associated with God in French. And even like namaste in, in, in Hinduism, in the sense of acknowledging the divine presence in someone else and acknowledging and respecting that, right? as a way of self protections become, you know, a way of greeting somebody, but it was also a way of respect and reverence in order to not offend or evoke any potential danger from that. And then uh, we have throughout history too, and it's very strong in the West, is the power of the heavens, that there is an energy or force that the stars, the planets, the sun and the moon they have upon us here on earth. And that's the whole basis of astrology. And you get Chinese astrology, Indian astrology, and of course in the West, the, the Western form of astrology. And, uh, and it's as though the stars dictate and rule the world. These higher forces of the heavens determine what happens here on earth. And in the Greco-Roman tradition in the West, it was seen as, as something oppressive, a type of celestial tyranny, <laughs> and that the goal would be to escape the prison of the seven planets. It was seen rather fatalistic that they dictated your destiny, right? Was, everything is uh, predetermined in a fatalistic way as to what happens based on the movement of the planets and, and the stars. And so what develops there is the quest, the spiritual quest for the soul to ascend from the evil elements of this world to get beyond the seven spheres that are associated with the seven planets to get beyond that to the eighth sphere. And at the eighth sphere, sphere is where you can overcome the powers of this world, the principalities and powers of this world that are dominating and ruling this world. And then in the Christian sense, <clears throat> that eight sphere is associated with Christ uh, that has overcome those principalities and powers. And you got to keep in mind that at that time period, um, each of the planets weren't seen as just, you know, dead balls of matter going around in the sky. They were seen as living beings, that there was an intelligence, a consciousness, in fact, a god. They were living gods, those planets. And, uh, uh, and they had power. All right. So, so that was very much the idea. The idea. So this was kind of idea with principalities and powers. They were also beings, okay, as well as forces. And we want to be free from the imprisonment of these forces. And so then in the Talmud, there's a passage that says that Israel is not to be subject to this, these stars and the power of the stars. It's like, no, you are subject to God alone. God is the ultimate power. And so you are freed from the powers of this world. Oops. Okay. Then we also have aspects... <clears throat> here in terms of the power of animals. And we've already talked somewhat about this in terms of shaman, shamanism and, and shamanic kind of rituals. Uh, and this is again, something very, very ancient and universal. A sense of kinship with the animals, that there are powers that animals have, special powers. Uh, 
and that you can tap into these animal powers in various ways through rituals, through shape shifting, you know, putting on the masks and the, the bare skins and what have you and doing the dance to pull in and call on the, the spirit of the bear to get the power of the bear for a certain reason, right? Uh, but also as a sense that everybody has a power animal that is your protector, your guide, and empowers you. And if you are not connected with your power animal, then you're you're very vulnerable to illness, uh, danger, bad luck. Uh, good, not good. You know, there's going to be problems for you in your life. So it's so important to be connected to your power animal. And then with it, you have a sense of the clan. You know, we already talked about totemism, right? That, that there's a special animal that is sort of the ancestor of that lineage. Okay, that you're connected to. And so you can call in these powers and work with the energies associated with animals that there are powers there to access. And that's a lot of what shamanism and shamanic work does. But you also have, again, like with totemism, that idea of animal ancestry, that they even gave birth to humans, that they're ancestors of clans. We already talked about some of this, and that's evident in things like a coat of arms that's associated with your family line, that again, they'll be like, you know, the stag or the bear or the lion, different animals associated with that. And that also is connected with mascots for in terms of team sports, like a team will have a mascot. And, and that reflects this very ancient thing of some kind of an animal that is the power animal for that team. And for you to win the game and to be powerful as a team, you need to have your mascot there, right? Again, that just reflects some of these very ancient uh, ideas. And then some of these things shows up in fairy tales and different kinds of fairy uh, stories that you get there about this kinship with animals. It'll show up in a lot of old fairy tales, right? And just to give you a bit of an idea here, like what I found quite interesting coming across this here is um, going back even as late as 1845 in France. Um, the whole idea of this connection with animals is also very much a European thing, even in more recent times, so to speak. The death of a farmer would be announced to his cattle or his bees was something that was commonly done in, in Europe. Uh, even animal trials could be conducted where they can appear as witnesses to the accused. And the last of such trial involving animals, including animals, was in 1845 in France. Okay. So again, just to highlight this connection with animals. <clears throat> And of course, we've already seen that there's a connection between various deities with animals and the power of certain animals, okay? So the Demeter is associated with horses, the mare, Dionysus with a bull, right? Uh, many deities having those, again, what we've seen previously, half human, half animal forms, these stereomorphic forms. Then you also have traditions of um, uh, what's called lycanthropy, where humans become animals in this whole shape-shifting business, right? Where you have stories about the werewolf, uh, somebody, you know, at the time of full moon becoming a wolf <laughs> and, and going through this, you know, transformation. Well, in, in Europe as well, you have stories of, in Germany, of bears, uh, of be people becoming like a bear-skinned human being. In Indonesia, it would be crocodiles, dogs, cats, tigers. You've got stories around that. So you find these sorts of things uh, throughout the world, these kind of connections, which is, I, I find it also fascinating how universal so much of these elements are. And it's all, again, you know, who knows what it all is, but it's all, I find it all very interesting. <clears throat> Oops, let me just remove this here so you can see this. Hopefully you can see that. Um, <clears throat> so here, <clears throat> also tied in with this is that people have special powers, particular individuals will have a special power. And some of those special powers will be associated with the role that they play or something that it is that they're to do. So that, I hope I press record. Did I press record? Uh, let me just check. I think I did. Sometimes I forget. Yes, I did. Okay, good. Um, let me just, uh, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, so that for a warrior to be successful in battle, right? It's like they've got a special like warrior medicine or uh, yeah, war medicine. And they might be doing special rituals or whatever to acquire that extra power to be successful in battle. And then some people will just 
kind of acquire the sense of reputation through uh, their success in battle, that they've got a special mm, power here to be successful in battle. Same thing with somebody who becomes a king or a chief. Often there was a lot of concern that they had that special power to be successful in that particular role. And having that kind of special energy uh, that will bring prosperity, success, even happiness for a family, the well-beingness of a tribe. All right. It's, it's a sense that you need to have that extra kind of power for good luck to be blessed. Uh, it's something special. And, you know, for those of you who've done uh, my Judaism, you know, I talk about that in terms of the tradition in ancient Israel of how, you know, there was always a special blessing, a special prayer of blessing that was passed down from father to son, from the firstborn son. And it was held to have that would give you a special power to guarantee success, prosperity, well-being, protection, okay, all those good things. It's, it's very, very important. <clears throat> And so is held that some people have like associated with it, like a special gifting, you know, that, you know, we talk about somebody having a green thumb. Some people are really good. It's like, it's like a natural gift. They've got like a bit of special, like power to really grow, you know, their veggies or what have you. For others, there's a particular craft, you know, in terms of working with metal or in the arts or music or what have you, right? And so this is something that seems to also have been behind, you know, say the caste system that developed over in India, that there's a certain special power to be a priest or a warrior or to look after the cattle or the farm or the land, right? And that that then gets passed down in the family line, the special kind of energy power that they have for that success in that area. So, so you have this idea that, yeah, a warrior, you could have somebody who's a, war, you know, a soldier or whatever, it could be very physically strong and brave, but it's all for nothing if there isn't this special kind of blessing of a type of what's often called war medicine, a special kind of power. It's like a magic power. Um, it's interesting, as a little story in the Bible about Samson, who was Oh, held to be so powerful and strong and nobody could take him down. He had all this superpower around him, right? A special kind of power and strength. And however, they found out that if they could cut his hair, his power would be gone. And so there's a whole story about how they cut his hair and then he lost his power and his strength became that then of an ordinary man. And that was sort of somehow his power was tied in with his hair. And that's interesting. And that always makes me think of an, in India, you know, with, amongst the ascetics, they have a tradition of not cutting their hair and uh, trying to acquire power, tapas, this heat energy they can build up in their body through meditation, breathing techniques. And, and again, in their tradition, the Hindu tradition, you know, you don't cut your hair, like for the, the, the holy men, the saints there. Okay. And that gives them that extra power. Then they develop uh, uh, the various, uh, oh gosh, yeah. uh, you know, powers to be able to levitate, see into the future, do all kinds of, you know, magical sort of things. Now, here I just have a picture to the right up there is for the next slide of supposedly an aura. You know, you often have this kind of picture around saints and holy people both saints in the west and in the east and so with this is this whole belief that you find all over that people who do gain this power all right have a, gain a reputation of this kind of potency right they often then become known as saints they are venerated for their power this special kind of energy force around them that they have that you know, enable them to heal others, uh, enable them to get their prayers answered, right? Uh, there's some special power around them. And so in artwork, there'll be all kinds of paintings, all right, of holy people, East and West, where they'll have, you know, like an aura around them of light emitting from largely their head, but it's meant to be around their body. And this is, you know, what many today would call auras, right? And it's interesting, you'll find that in Buddhist paintings, Hindu paintings, and, you know, Christian saints, and in the West, you'll have a lot of that. So, and tied in with this, is that as a individual, as a holy person, they've got a power 
around them so that they can heal you and whatnot and say like in a lot of Indian traditions that for a holy man, you know, they'll touch you on the third eye and your forehead and that will open up you know, some kind of spiritual awakening for you, right? Uh, but just being touched by them has a power, right? Uh, so you'll have these kinds of uh, teachings. In, in Europe, there was a common teaching here and there about certain kings that had special powers. And if you could just, when it, when there was one tradition of just kissing the toe of a, a king in England, that that would automatically heal you, right? And they also would have objects, you know, the scepter that they hold on the throne, that special staff, sort of like a magic wand. It, it's, it's something that also can contain power. Right. And could do things, you know, to, you know, if you touch this and that or whatever you would do with it, but it had power in it. Um, but anyways, it, it's all interconnected as I go from person to objects and whatnot, because, again, it's this whole theme of mana, power, energy. Uh, but tied in with this is relics that after such a saint or holy person dies, it's held that that energy that they had in their life was still present in their remains. And so when they get cremated or if they're whatever, however their body is preserved, those then become relics, objects that contain power and become then a place where they're held, that those relics are held. This happens in India and happens in the West, uh, where they become then places of pilgrimage where people will go there and they receive answers to their prayers, maybe get healings, blessings, what have you, right? But they become objects of power, even their remains do right um and so you'll find throughout history that people get elevated to a certain status of having become of being so powerful so spiritual and there's so much energetic power around them they're elevated to like a saint in catholicism or in pure land buddhism elevated to be known as bodhisattvas right and then it's held that in the afterlife after they die they reside up there in the heavens you be over in Buddhism or in Catholicism, and they've got powers up there that they can pass on to you. You can pray to them and they can help you out with things. And they can, again, just pass on some of their power to you, right? So if you did my other courses, you know, we talk about some of these things. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah. And that's what I was talking about. Cities is what they call those paranormal abilities that in yoga, as you practice asceticism and various things associated with yoga, you can increase the energy within yourself, okay? And that then uh, can lead to the birthing of paranormal abilities known as cities, okay? Uh, okay, so let me just let's see this is, all right. There also are uh, objects that have power, which I already kind of intimated. Oh, yeah, I already talked a bit about it, said so that the holy objects of power, like the Ark of the Covenant that I mentioned earlier with Raiders of the Lost Ark. And, uh, you know, if you touch it, you die. You know, if you haven't ever seen the movie, you got to see the movie. It's good stuff, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think they're just great movies. Anyway, and then here to the right is a little picture of the Kaaba at Mecca. And there is believed that one particular wall of the Mecca has a special blessing, has a special power on it and people will try to touch it all right as you can see there people are reaching their hands out trying to touch it and that that will bring them a special blessing okay so this kind of idea is very common so you've got amulets of protection uh we've already talked about some of this stuff uh you know certain objects that are that 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 are imbued with a special power right that can either bring protection healing prosperity fertility whatever it is that you need okay and then sometimes it held this object actually contains a spirit in it that it can uh, have a special spirit in it. It could be an evil spirit or a good spirit, right? That can again affect you in ways. And then tools that are used in ritual are usually held to have special powers associated with them. So a sacred drum has been, it's, it's, it accumulates energy, it's maybe gone through a ritual of being blessed in a certain way, so it's got special energy to, so it can do effectively what it's designed to do. Same thing with a magic wand or a staff or a medicine bag, various tools that are used in all kinds, excuse me, all kinds of ways, right? As I mentioned, the scepter of, of the royal, uh, uh, in terms of royalty mascots, what have you, uh, they all acquire power, energy, some kind of a force. Okay? And these forces are invisible, but they have an effect. 
and you can often sense them and pick it up, right? And then you can use that energy for good or evil, right? And that's, I think, on the next slide. So that, whoopsie, as it says here, okay, mana itself, this energy is actually neutral. It's amoral, impersonal, but it's a power or energy that can be directed and used for good or evil to heal or to curse and attack, okay? And so you'll find throughout history, uh, all over the world is that there are quote, often called witch doctors, whatever you want to call them, or magicians, but people who know how to work these energies, and they'll use them, and they'll be at war with each other, and they'll be cursing each other, attacking, attacking each other. Uh, you'll come across this material all over the place. And so uh, that's a whole thing. You got to then protect yourself from any kind of uh, dark magic like this. But it's, it's energy that's neutral, but people will... Um, kind of collect it in a certain ways and infuse it for dark purposes. And then it becomes kind of like a dark energy, an evil energy that you can just feel, you know, the fear that it's negative, that it's harmful. You can pick up that energy and it has that effect, you know, and that's what you'll find when, you know, in terms of black magic and things like that. Um, yeah, so, so there you go. Um, now this energy is something that's held to just simply exist throughout the universe in a rather cosmic way. It's almost like it's just a, a hidden life force within the universe that's there everywhere in some way. And this life force sometimes is more strongly in this area, in this object, with this thing, with that thing. It can be directed in certain ways, uh, manipulated in certain ways, but it's just kind of there as a part of nature itself, okay? a part of the universe and so uh this flow of nature this energy flow uh is often seen as, as sometimes as an intelligence but just as a force and uh, that's rather neutral and so it's often called like the Tao in china rita in india in india the vedic tradition asha in iran maat in egypt daik in greek okay sort of like a cosmic order in the universe this energy that regulates things, uh, has the rains come, has the rains go, the sun rise, set, etc. Okay, and that's sort of intrinsic to the universe. Um, and so it's more so that than a god imposing it on nature. It's just it's held to be intrinsic. It's just a part of nature itself. It's just inbuilt into the universe. Okay, but it's largely unseen by the naked eye. And it's something you tune into through largely non-physical physical ways. I mean, we can sense it physically in ways, right? But yet in terms of modern science, they try to analyze it and say, well, I can't grab it, feel it, measure it. It doesn't exist. I mean, that's all changing now, you know, with quantum theory and our understanding of electromagnetic force fields and all that sort of stuff. But if you go back, you know, into the 17 and 1800s, when science was just developing, really, <clears throat> in ways, there was all this skepticism. Okay, where, you know, like, uh, you know, my other, my video in terms of new religions, where I talk about mesmerism and Franz Anton Mesmer and animal magnetism. And he was basically discovering, you know, the power of magnets and magnetic force fields. But yet, because they couldn't see it and grab it, all right, uh, they claimed these things just didn't exist and, and condemned it as quackery. But this is something that again, has existed across time, and we're just now tuning into it a bit more in, in a scientific sense. Okay, so the second aspect of the sacred here, you know, in terms of this whole section, is as consciousness, as will, and this is where we talk about animism, that there's a sense people experience that there's an intelligence, an encounter with a being in, in life, in reality, okay? So mana is sort of just power or energy or force, all right, the human experience of the sacred in terms of a special potency, energy, power in maybe objects, places, aspects of nature, animals, etc., even in humans, all right, in terms of if they're saints or specific, particular roles that they play. But the other key modality of the sacred in terms of human experience is the sense of experiencing this holy other as a conscious being, uh, a person, you know, something personal in nature, having a sense of will. All right, as a somebody, all right, as someone instead of just a something. Okay, 
And, uh, and so here it can begin, you know, we're like here, like in Northern Europe, uh, it used to be a pagan tradition of the farmer going out at Christmas Eve and saying to the trees and speaking to them as though they're living beings, a type of consciousness there, telling them it's time for you to kind of start waking up here so you can bear many apples and fruit, you know, pears for the coming year, right? Speaking to them as being conscious. So it's a little bit different from working with it as a force of energy is now conscious that you talk to and it understands there's communication and there's will, right? It's a key thing here. So this is now where we're transitioning from forces into spirits <laughs> and they mentioned gods. And so the stronger the human experience of a sense of a will, of a consciousness in another being, the more that that will become a god instead of just being a spirit, all right? More limited will, which is uh, expressing more limited power of will, okay, then it's more of a spirit. But more that will becomes more powerful and stronger, like, whoa, then it becomes more of a god, okay? So with a lesser will, it's more of a lower spirit, and stronger will, it becomes a god, right? It's just about greater power and energy, but it's expressed through will, all right? Hopefully that makes some sense, okay? So again, just broadly speaking, uh, what a trend has been is widespread is the idea that the heavenlies up there in the sky is more masculine as a sky god. All right. uh, and the sky god up there in the heavens establishes the laws, gives commands and rules of what's right and wrong, uh, acts upon the world more with force and power, giving directives, and usually is seen as creator. Right is the more doing side of things, is the more willful, right? And therefore, in a sense, more conscious. Consciousness is associated with that, right? And that's probably why, you know, you get this greater emphasis on the supreme being creator as being more masculine in a lot of ways, okay? On the other hand, the earth is usually depicted more feminine terms as mother and, and that which is more receptive. It receives impregnation. It's a receptacle. It receives the rain to come down on the earth and the sun to shine down on the earth. It's like, you know, the penis going into the vagina, all right? The earth is more passive and receptive and then just naturally gives birth. It's a little bit more passive, whereas the sky goes more the active part. The earth is more passive. And with that, it represents more the being side of things, just the flow tied in more with energy of the energy of life, the life of the fields and the fertility of the seasons and the cycle of the seasons and the cycle of birth. And that's natural. And it's just an ongoing flow and process of things. And it's a bit more passive as opposed to the sky god creates in a more powerful way out of nothing, you know, made everything appear out of nothing. It's a different kind of dynamic at play, right? So this is just something to kind of keep that in mind, uh, that these kind of tendencies exist here. Uh, what do I have here on the next one? Okay, hang on here. Let's just make sure you can read this. So trends over time. If a religion emphasizes more the doing part and the more of God as will, as creator, it kind of tends to turn away more from the idea of Mother Earth, okay? And that's what you definitely have very strongly more so in the Western traditions. Uh, it seems definitely you find throughout the world, really, you know, there are many sources that have mentioned this and, and, and Stark does and others, uh, a widespread belief in a high God as creator, right? But this high God is largely distant, far away, quite invisible and unknown, is eternal, is basically benevolent, is the guardian of the order of the universe, but rather distant and remote, okay? And, and this is where in India, Varuna is a classic example of what happens there. For those of you who did the Eastern religions, Varuna, okay, is the guardian of the cosmic order who's up there in the heavens in a thousand columned uh, palace and basically oversees the cosmic moral order and has spirits coming down to earth, checking on people if they're good or bad, <laughs> naughty or nice and keeping a record of those deeds. And then they hand in a report to uh, Varuna just like over in China, 
uh, the stove god hands in a report of the family to the Jade Emperor, who's running the universe up there. Okay. And just like with Santa Claus, he keeps a record. If you're naughty, you're nice, right? You know, it's, it's interesting how you have all these different traditions that that there are lower spirits like your guardian angel or whatever you know keeping a record of things and handing it in to the big boss upstairs who is overseeing the cosmic moral order that determines you know your destiny when you die if it be good karma bad karma rebirth or heaven hell judgment whatever it's you're held accountable for your deeds and there's a record being kept it's really quite universal right um so anyways, uh, but, but this God is rather distant, you know, like the Jade Emperor Verona kind of fades out of the picture. Yeah? Uh, and, but the God of the Bible, and, you know, it goes a bit of a different route uh, where this God gets brought into the table to be more personal, okay, in, in the biblical tradition. But anyway, whereas you do have polytheism is universal, gods and goddesses galore, very much anthropomorphic, very human-like, pantheons existing, that is clusters of families, how, well, this is the mother, the father, this is the son, this is the brother, this is the sister, you know, they form families, and they all have different roles and occupations and offices, where they basically are helping to run the universe at this level, but the, the high God is up there overseeing it all, and they're sort of like you know, well, in China, they, they present them as the aristocrats. They're helping uh, their government officials, helping the emperor run the empire. Okay, they're like lower government officials, assistants to the main god helping to run the show. Okay, this is kind of how, how, how you get a lot of this. But over time, uh, they tended to, because as people, and we'll talk more about this, okay, soon, they're, they're kind of, shifts happen generally around 600 BC you know you see it in India uh you know, uh, you know maybe a bit in China not really but more so in India and in the Greco-Roman world and in the Jewish tradition is you get more of a movement away from polytheism to monotheism and uh, and these many deities get more united under the idea that they're just different gods uh, uh, that have different names, but really is one God with many names. It's, they're just different aspects of the one supreme being inside of an idea. Uh, this kind of trend happens. And we'll talk more about that later, okay? But just so you, just to be aware of that. Uh, also what forms is this kind of trend towards monotheism as the world religions start being birthed in ways. You also have a lot of triads. One main god is a chief and other lesser gods are assistants, angels or rebels. You get kind of dualism of good versus evil uh, and this sort of thing happening. They kind of get organized like this in ways. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so I was mentioning there's a bit of a shift eventually over uh, away from polytheism. So that, for example, the universe under the rule of gods was the Greeks found oppressive, okay? And they were often in deep anxiety over the will of the gods. It was like, this was so fatalistic. It's sort of like the gods decide that, and man, I'm stuck with it. And so they attempted to try to get freed, freed from the gods dictating over their, their fate, determining their destiny, destiny. Okay, it was held to be rather fickle that whatever the gods decided, that's what ends up happening to you. It's like, well, no, I want to control my own destiny. Okay, so there in, in the Greek Roman world, the idea develops increasingly that you, in order to transcend, overcome this world of fate, where everything's determined by these gods, you need to rise above this world, this world of the many to go into the higher world of the one, the source of it all, this impersonal absolute that they ended up labeling largely as logos, reason, the rational, okay? That was sort of the quest in, in the Greco-Roman world amongst like Neoplatonism that develops. Um, and so from here, nature itself is seen as divine operating, but doesn't really require the gods to operate. It operates on the basis of reason and law order okay and that's kind of the beginnings of science the development of science in terms that there are laws of nature and they're rational and they are in order and it's not fickle um okay it, there's order to the universe it's rational 
So this is something that develops in the Greco-Roman world in the West. And then over in India, there's increased skepticism about the polytheism like, hey, there's all these different gods. Uh, who really does have the ultimate power? Uh, can we really believe the all these different little gods running the universe? Anyway, and again, I mean, you know, when I do the Hinduism, I'll probably maybe talk about this more later, but it gives rise to the concept that really there's one supreme being, an impersonal, absolute, pure being, consciousness, bliss, known as Brahman, that is the source of the universe. And that what we call many gods of different names are really just the one supreme being manifesting in different forms with different names, but they're really just different aspects of one supreme being. That's sort of basically what develops in Hinduism. Okay, uh, They basically are, in a sense, monotheist to a sense that there really is only one supreme being but that being can show up in different forms and take on different names and therefore has different characteristics that reflect certain aspects right that's kind of an idea that develops there okay i think that's it for today here in terms of uh what we're going to do here okay all right hopefully that all makes a bit of sense just to give you a bit of an introduction to some aspects here of how uh, the spiritual is seen in terms of both energy and will.